I will record from now on. Uh, Yep. Just in Inspira, yeah. So currently the delivery is 7th of May. I'm trying to make it 9th or 10th, uh, but the, that I need to talk with exam office, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're allowed to, to, you're allowed to work on the project until the submission deadline. Uh, the only problem is that because we're pushing it really to the end, there will be no peer review for the projects. So the, the last peer review is for assignment two, and then the projects, you will not kind of have peer review in the projects. Uh, I will review everybody myself together with Christopher, right? Um, I know you had, uh, um, some of you had the peer review for the projects in the database, I think, and in cloud. So yeah, if we skip peer review in this one, that's okay, right? Yeah, yeah. And that gives you a little bit more time to finish. I, I prefer you finishing the project with those extra days than uh, spending them on peer review, right? Yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, you didn't have a good solution. Would it be good to say, um, what could you have made it easier? Yeah, so you don't need to, exactly. So the, in the exam, you don't have to report what you've done. You can report what you could have done if you were redoing it, right? So the exam is kind of like a, a new, uh, like clean slate. <laughs> so if you now know what you could have done better, you can describe that in the exam. So you don't need to say what you actually did uh, or didn't do. Uh, you can do what you think you would do now if you were doing this. So you don't have to be based on what you did in assignment two, but what I'm saying is that the questions will relate to assignment two, such that if you know you can recall some of your thinking and some, some things that you've done, but you don't have to report exactly what you've done. Of course, you can just say uh, what would make it easier. Um, I know, for example, that some of you tried to um, implement like a type class, for some of the operations. And I don't think it's a good idea, actually. I, I don't think it helps to have a type class with a, like class and multiplication operations in the class because they are quite specific to particular token types. And it's actually easier to manage that if you have like a, just, if you have a, a functional approach to, to this. Um, so I kind of discourage some of you to uh, implement type class for this because I, I think it's just uh, an overkill. I mean. Um, maybe, uh, but I, I haven't used it myself and I, and I feel it's a little bit of, a, of an overkill. It's, it's a little bit easier if you decompose it into uh, smaller functions and kind of deal with functions. But yeah, maybe you had some kind of a, a idea or something that uh, worked for you. Uh, so that, yeah, that leads me to another comment that um, maybe some of you kind of looked on the internet and some of the Beefer interpreters are using kind of type classes to implement some of the features that they need. Um, this assignment was not like that. The assignment was like super simple for you to ex uh, experiment with just a simple functions. Uh, so there was no need to do type classes. Uh, it would make it easier, your life easier if you used like some of the monads, like a state monad, for example, or like, of course, maybe or either and so on. But like diving deep into like type classes and, and doing something really heavy uh, was not necessary in, in this assignment. So um, it, it is unfortunate that um, like that hasn't been communicated early enough. And some of you kind of tried to find something online and then got a bit sidetracked by the requirements of a bigger projects uh, related to programming languages or interpreters. That was not like that. It, it was supposed to be just a very simple extension of the calculator, which has those kind of uh, additional features, but you use the same kind of uh, mechanisms. You just kind of make to organize yourself in a, in a tidy way. Um, but yeah, I mean, lesson learned. And like COVID was a, a bit of a problem. Like uh, if we are here and we can kind of ask questions and discuss, it's much easier to clarify things. If we're doing it over issue tracker and, and uh, Discord and, you know, a text, uh, a lot of nuances kind of lost. So, yeah. Yeah, other questions?
I kind of enjoyed the last, like, uh, let's say 10 days because uh, there was a lot of questions and a lot of discussions on the Discord and uh, issue tracker. And I could see that you guys were kind of uh, progressing and you've learned a ton of new things in Haskell. <laughs> uh, so that's great. That's, uh, that's what it, you know, was supposed to be all about. Um, and the, I know uh, many of you did kind of a progressed uh, in understanding and kind of certain things clicked. So that's great. If it didn't click yet, give it time. I mean, um, as I said, I, I was learning Haskell for a very long time and certain things didn't click for a long time. So you just need to be patient. Uh, the thing with Haskell is that you should not try those kind of a really hard things before you get your head around the easier things first. Um, so there are kind of, for example, uh, interesting libraries like Lens, uh, Lenses, uh, and that is uh, kind of hard and people are banging their heads uh, over like how it actually works uh, for a very long time. Uh, and that's just normal, like uh, Haskell is kind of like that. Um, Golang is not like that. In Golang, you can start using all the language features from day one. Um, and there is nothing to be waiting for like deep understanding. It's like a super easy language. Um, with Haskell, that's not the case. Okay, I'm, I'm ranting a bit. So I let you ask questions. <laughs> Yeah, next semester you will have a mobile uh, course and an integration project and some um, some other kind of courses. And from next semester on, there is no requirement for any specific programming language. It's all always up to you. Um, in game programming, there is a C sharp mostly because the lecturer is kind of a C sharp uh, wizard, so he does his all his work in C sharp. But there is you you know we had projects in. Um, and yeah, we had projects in Python. Uh, we have C++, we had um, C Sharp or uh, un Unreal uh, Visual you know, uh, Coding Language. Um, so it's up to you. So for next semester, all courses next semester, you can pick and uh, focus on the language that you want to master. Uh, and then uh, for the bachelor is the same. So what, what I suggest is that you, uh, um, continue developing the language that you really like and you're kind of getting really good at to, uh, next semester, but you also try to master the language that is kind of uh, a little bit uh, weaker. And then for the bachelor, you will kind of be able to uh, just pick one probably. Um, we have people this, this semester doing, um, if they're doing some visual apps like games and things like this, they use, use probably an engine so they, you usually use C sharp uh, because Unity is using C sharp and for mobile and for um, VR and, and so on, Unity is quite good. Uh, some people are, are using Unreal and then they stick to C++. Um, for people who are developing on mobile, um, all of them are using Kotlin. So we've migrated uh, two years ago away from Java and uh, on Android. And then Kotlin is the de facto language. You will, you will learn Kotlin next semester in the mobile course. Um, so we had a virtual group, a couple of virtual groups which are doing Kotlin this semester. Uh, I don't, uh, we don't have any groups this semester doing uh, Rust or Haskell because we didn't have it. But I'm hoping yeah, next year you guys will pick um, projects that relate on those tech technology stacks. Yeah, there was a, a short discussion on the web stacks um, and yeah, th th that's a little bit cultural. Like uh, we, we have web development uh, bachelor in the design department, and those guys are using kind of a web stack technology. Uh, we do a little bit of that, like for example, in the uh, cloud course, but we don't use the same stack, right? We, we did uh, maybe like five years ago, we did use Node.js for backend and JavaScript on the front end, but we went away from it. Uh, the reason why we went away from it is because those uh, frameworks and those things change, you know, every two months. So, and every year you have to do everything from scratch because everything is different and APIs are different and things change and like your code doesn't work. 
uh, not only your code doesn't work, your code has a lot of security vulnerabilities, which you need to patch, right? So every year we were like, when we were preparing for the course, we had to update our software and it was like a lot of work. So we said, okay, screw it. Like, it's not worth it. Uh, let's go with Go. Uh, with Go, like, you know, it's continuous. Like you, you, sometimes you need to update your dependencies, but it's very rare. Uh, and also you can have everything kind of in the standard library. Um, so it is uh, much better to use backend like with a proper managed language. Um, but, you know, Node.js has its place and it, it is very popular for prototyping things and for uh, doing rapid development. And I agree, it, it's great, it's uh, super efficient, uh, but it's not something that you want to maintain over a duration of the prototype. So if you're planning to have something that you will be maintaining over a couple of years, then most of the web technology stack that currently exists is, is really bad. Um, so yeah, we always have those kind of uh, discussions about the, you know, what sort of software stack is better to be used. Uh, and, and web is, yeah, it's kind of evolving, changing, and it's a bit tricky. Um, we, we didn't figure it out, like how, how to make it kind of um, long-term maintainable. Yep, so. Right, so another question from Sindra. He implemented something really complicated and uh, worries that it will um, kind of impact the grade. So no, it will not impact the grade. If you explain in the readme file, like what you could have done differently, uh, that's what counts. So as I'm saying, like, you, you get the grade not for the product, but you get the grade for the way you thought about doing it. Um, so if you can explain in the readme file, like what you could have done differently, then that counts also. So uh, how could you, for example, simplify things and so on? Of course, if your code is super untidy and you have like, um, you know, some uh, spaghetti code, that is not good. Uh, so if you could tidy that up a little bit, uh, at least that would be good. Um, so don't don't leave kind of unprofessional things if you can uh, easily fix them. But some design decisions you can fix, right? So if you are committed to a particular pattern, then you need to stick to it. Otherwise, you will have to rebuild everything from scratch, right? So that's okay. Then you can explain in the readme file. Yep. Yep. Yeah, very good question. So the uh, I don't know. Did you guys hear the question? I, I, I yeah, I will repeat. So the first question is. Um, if you take a game programming course, uh, is it a disadvantage if you have a Mac? Uh, and the answer is no, uh, not at all. Um, most of the examples and like for the game programming course, there, there are two types of students. So there are students who kind of really into graphics and are really into games, and they want to do kind of the game engine themselves. And they usually do it in C++, they can, or OpenGL, they kind of extend whatever they've done in the graphics course into something more interactive, right? So in the graphics, you did some things, but here you're kind of taking it more like reusing what you've learned there and making it kind of a more of an interactive something like a game, uh, but you're kind of in full control, right? And those are kind of uh, people who are usually thinking about continuing with uh, some visual development, right? You, you don't need to go into the game industry to be doing that. Like for example, we have uh, Per Morten who got into um, a kind of um, augmented reality projects where they visualize uh, 3D CAD you know, models. And it has nothing to do with games, but the technology is exactly the same. You're basically visualizing 3D objects and you're kind of navigating the camera and, and doing things like this efficiently, right? Um, and there is quite a lot of that in Norway, like for example, for uh, oil industry and, and so on, they do need 3D visualizations and like uh, tourism, like with drones and with visualizing some of the, you know, things like, uh, like 
you know, uh, physical objects. And we, we had a couple of bachelor projects, for example, in robotics, where you have to navigate the arm of the robot and kind of visualize the 3D environment, like so the robot can kind of pick things. So they, they, they used kind of a VR to train the robot in the VR such that then it's like much faster. You, you don't because, you know, you do all the calculations like super fast. And then they try to kind of see how it kind of works with the physical environment, right? So they, they did kind of the, the mapping. We had another bachelor which did uh, 3D visualization of uh, real estate uh, properties such that you can have a virtual tour over, a, you know, an apartment. Uh, which was completely virtual, right? It was like uh, textured and everything from the real uh, uh, environment. But then the actual model was kind of a virtual such that you, you have like a VR headset and you can kind of walk around, right? Um, so it doesn't have to be uh, with games, but this, this is sort of the, the, uh, the skill set that you will need to do those type of jobs. Uh, so those people are usually going with uh, C++ um, and OpenGL. But then you have kind of a casual programmers who just want to do it for fun. And then using a game engine like Unity or Unreal is, is much better because then you don't need to deal with all the low level crap yourself. It's kind of taking care for you. And you just fo focus on some fun elements like some you know open world or something that, that makes the game a game, right? Uh, so those people usually use C Sharp. Uh, and then Unity on Mac works perfectly fine, right? And then same with Unreal. So I, I've been teaching that course before and I had a Mac and it was great. Um, the current lecturer, he's a game developer. He has his own company. He actually develops mobile games and, and, and so on. And he's using Windows, but you don't have to use Windows, right? So it, it makes uh, no difference. There is, um, there is one small problem with the course as it is um, currently advertised uh, because it says that you need to have AI course and graphics uh, as a prerequisite. Um, we are changing that because uh, it, it used to be different. So it used to, like the graphics prerequisite kind of makes sense because if you'd have not, no knowledge about graphics, then it will be hard, even if you're using Unity to, to, for you to understand you know, uh, what is happening. Uh, but the AI course, which we had in the past was different. It was, um, the current AI course is based on like machine learning and um, kind of data science. And the AI course, which we used to have before was more aligned with the pro uh, game programming um, bachelor. And we did use some uh, algorithms like A star or uh, some neural networks or some genetic algorithms for doing some search, but it was in the context of like uh, fun activities like games. Right, so we, like for example, we were trying to make a Super Mario being controlled by the algorithm such that it can decide when to jump over the obstacles, right? So you just uh, have your data set being kind of some gameplays and you're trying to teach it to jump in a proper proper place, right? Um, so we had projects like that. So it had, it had kind of similar elements, but we were not just doing kind of a quote, quote, boring data science. We were kind of doing more of a, um, Fun thing. So, so the current AI is definitely not a prerequisite for the game force, but it still says it is. And and we, I'm not sure if we will be like we we didn't notice that. Like we have to do those changes like you know nine months ago, uh, and we didn't notice that it said it's still prerequisite for the uh, with the AI. Uh, but we kind of changing it so you will not need to have AI course to take the game programming course. It's it's it has nothing to do with AI, uh, you know, um, with the current AI. Right, so that's the, the first question. The second question is um, the mobile course. Um, yeah, so the, you know, when the course was 10 points, it was still hard to teach iOS and Android in the single course uh, because they are both quite uh, complex frameworks and you need to learn quite a lot of concepts uh, for mobile programming. So what happened was with, with the 10 point course, we basically were kind of doing everything on Android and then allowing people who, uh, who had Macs and iPhones to kind of do an iOS development, but uh, most examples and most things were kind of given an Android. And then you need to work out like how to do it in Swift or you know, Objective-C yourself. Um, and we allowed people to do the, uh, the submission of assignments in, um, on iOS if they wanted to, uh, but it was not part of the course. And now with the seven and a half points, that's even less time, right? The course is even smaller. So, um, you know, we will have examples and we will have 
kind of everything on Android. Um, and then if you don't have a device, then you can't really um, do certain things like uh, deploy on the physical device, use the camera and so on. You can do most of it on the emulator. Uh, you can even emulate the GPS coordinates. You can emulate some sensor signals, but it is different. Like it's, it's not the same. Like for example, we had um, two years ago, we had an assignment where you take your phone uh, and you kind of uh, drew a plane and drew like a ball and you can kind of, uh, by moving the phone, the ball will roll, right? Uh, so you, you just use a gyroscope and you move the ball in the direction where the, you know, the gyro tells you is down, right? Uh, that's such a kind of fun project, but if you don't have a device and you're just using emulator, like how are you going to play with it, right? It's like you can't. Um, so it, it is advisable for people to have, like to buy just some cheap Android phone and just have a physical device. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, right? Um, if you don't have, we do have some devices that we lend to, to students, but we have like maybe five of them. So um, not everyone will get a device, right? So yeah, from experience, I know that uh, most people who were taking the course, they eventually bought some cheap Android just to play with it. Um, and then it's fun, like you can flash it, you know, you can root it, you can kind of uh, have some fun with it, right? Uh, and the, the Android devices, the, the Chinese knockoffs are not that expensive. So I would advise to, to, to play with it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, no. So um, actually developing for Android on Mac is easier than on uh, Windows. <laughs> so it's perfect. Yeah, uh, I know. I don't know the latest statistics, but I know that uh, most of the developers in uh, Google who are developing for Android, uh, most of them were using Macs, actually. Uh, it, it's super easy on both. Uh, it, it is super easy on Linux, too. Uh, so there is no problem with the mobile cores in either of the OSs. Um, Android Studio works on all of three, and uh, the SDK and the NDK, they work on all three, and it's great. Like, the experience is fine on, on all systems. Uh, with game programming, uh, the experience on Linux is a little bit uh, diminished, so to say, okay? You can do it, and especially if you are doing this kind of a hardcore C++ development, then it doesn't matter. Um, but for like Unity or Unreal, I know uh, Linux was, uh, it's not that great. So Mac and Windows are fine, both are the same, uh, but Linux is a little bit um, problematic. So for those people who want to take game programming course and uh, hardcore Linux users, then maybe you need to get some, yeah, some alternative uh, sorted out. I don't know, like I can check with, um, with Richard uh, what he thinks about Linux, but I know historically that was a little bit of a problem. Most people who I use hardcore Linux guys are kind of uh, hackers and they get it going anyway, they will make it work. But um, I know that that might be a little bit problematic. Yeah. Other questions? The, the game programming is fun. I, I would recommend you taking it. Um, it's, um, it used to be just a single project. Like, so you have some lectures and you're working kind of on a single thing all, all, the whole semester. Um, I don't know what Richard will do now because it's, it became seven and a half points. So it, it's smaller. Uh, it used to be 10, of course. Um, and uh, he has some kind of nice insights uh, into the debugging and into like the industry and like supporting multiple platforms. Um, so he, yeah, I, I kind of, um, uh, I think the course was okay last semester. There were no uh, kind of issues or anything, so. Yeah, so, so we didn't have a project last, last, like when we had three 10 point courses, we had um, mobile game programming and um, mobile game programming, and I think an elective maybe. So there, there was no project uh, in the fifth semester. 
Now we have integration project, which Tom is managing. And the idea is that you will kind of develop something uh, from uh, the technology stack that you've learned. So something maybe with mobile, something with backend, like with cloud, something with uh, game programming. Uh, so the, the project is kind of a seven and a half point placeholder for you to experience like working on a project, which is a little bit bigger uh, because the whole point of the course is the project. And that will be preparing you for the bachelor. Uh, we used to have game programming as, a, as this course. So people were developing something kind of uh, over the semester, which then they could either continue for their bachelor or do something else. Um, now we have the, um, the integration project instead. Yeah, there is, um, I didn't announce it, but there are some uh, opportunities for an exchange. We, we have, um, like those of you who are thinking about exchange, uh, then the fifth semester might be a, a kind of a good semester to go. Um, so ch check with the um, international office. Uh, they have some offers and they have some universities which are kind of uh, often advertising for a semester placement. Uh, I know the Corona situation is a bit shitty um, and also like uh, doing uh, an exchange over Zoom doesn't appeal to me, although some universities started doing that such that you can take some courses from another university just over Zoom and be kind of stay in Norway uh, over next semester anyway. Uh, that's an option. So we will see like um, I think the, the biggest appeal of exchange is just to go to a different country and experience different cultures. So staying here and doing it over Zoom, I'm not sure I would do it myself, but maybe that's a, uh, yeah, maybe it appeals to some people. Um, so you can, uh, you can explore it. So if, so, so there are two types of exchanges. Like one type is that you will have to wait with your bachelor, like uh, you, you will kind of miss uh, the, the semester, right? Uh, so people usually do it over a year. So they go away for a year, then they come back and they finish. So the degree becomes like a four year degree. Uh, and there are exchanges where you don't miss a semester or a year. And then you can take uh, the courses or substitute the courses such that the, the, the total amount of points counts the same. And then you come back and you finish your bachelor, right? Uh, we had some students going in the fifth semester and then doing the bachelor from overseas or from somewhere, um, from abroad. In New Zealand, everything was overseas. So uh, you, you always use the term overseas. <laughs> Here it's just abroad. Uh, you can get the by land. Um, yeah, anyway, so, so you can kind of uh, do the, the project kind of in a different country, uh, or you can kind of come back here. I know we have like those of you who are interested in game programming and game design, uh, we have a really good program in uh, Portugal and they, they are very similar to us. They have very similar courses and they have a very similar structure and they kind of, are but they have a bit more practical um, project-based uh, curriculum such that you kind of, uh, if you go for an exchange, you will be kind of involved in projects. So you can do um, a bachelor with them as well. So you can stay instead of a semester, you can stay a year. Uh, we had some students with, with them before. Um, so Portugal is kind of a good, um, good place. Um, yeah, Germany, Austria. We are, we have like, if you contact the international office, they will tell you. Yeah. I, I kind of like the concept. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's interesting to see how other universities are working and what, how they teach. Um, some programs, some programming programs are more project-based. So we have more courses, course-based uh, degree, uh, but some programs are like you only do projects like um, two or three projects per semester. Uh, and then you combine different elements uh, from, from, yeah, from the curriculum. So I know like, um, in Nord University, they have, uh, for example, a project where they do AI. So they do some sort of um, system with enemies and uh, non-playing characters, which have to navigate and have to solve something. Uh, so you have to include some sort of search algorithms or some sort of uh, AI mechanisms. And that's a project. So that they don't have any lectures or anything. It's kind of a project base. And the same for networking. Um, 
but we yeah we kind of try to mix yeah what else can i tell you about next semester um yeah yeah so uh that is uh I know that course from uh, two years ago, and it was great. Like when Eric started teaching it, uh, it is kind of like an extension of the cloud course, but going much more deep into the uh, management of the infrastructure, like cloud infrastructure, right? So you are uh, learning how to set up um, routers, how to set up like in, in software, right? You're not playing with any hardware. <laughs> you, you're doing everything in virtual environment, like an open cloud or open stack or in like Amazon, right? Cloud. Uh, so you, you're setting up like the routers, you're setting up your uh, VPNs, your networks, you're setting up like the uh, load balancers, the web servers, and then you kind of are playing with the configuration and you're doing it kind of as, a, as code, like as scripts. Uh, so you're automating everything. You kind of are saying, okay, I want to have a database, two web servers, which load balance, load balancer, and some sort of a firewall, right? So you kind of code everything and you kind of instantiate it and you're doing a deployment on OpenStack, like in Sky High. Uh, so it, it is a, co a course that you, if you're interested in kind of learning more about the cloud and learning more about the kind of the virtualized um, uh, appliances that you can instantiate, then that would be the course for you. And I believe they do teach Kubernetes as well. So they work with uh, Kubernetes clusters and like you set up the uh, uh, the Docker containers being deployed on the Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, we didn't do that. Like we were always thinking about it with Christopher, uh, but like even with 10 point course, that was always too much. So we never had this, and now with seven and a half, that's never gonna happen, right? So if you want to learn more, I would encourage you to take that that course, right? Um, and uh, Eric and the, the team that are um, managing the Sky High, they are great. Uh, they know what they're doing, and it's yeah, it's kind of uh, interesting from that perspective, yeah. So I, I know that, that I know that course and I kind of can recommend it as a follow up on the cloud course. So if you enjoyed cloud course and you like dealing with all these things, then you will like that. Yeah. Uh, what else? Yeah, let me see what else you guys have next semester quickly. So mobile programming software security, right? So um, software security with Basel is also an interesting course, but it like, um, so in, in uh, like we used to be one department, uh, now we are kind of uh, three departments, right? So we used to be just one big department here in Jovic, uh, which had design security and the core computer science. And we were kind of split. So uh, the design went into the architecture and uh, now they are kind of in the architecture institute, <laughs> which is weird, but they do have uh, web programming and they are kind of, they, they continue having some uh, computational things, but the history, like the, the background of the design is not software. It's kind of the, the physical artifacts, right? So designing chairs and, and things like this, right? Uh, software is kind of there, but it, it is, um, not the core of the of the design department. They play a lot with like uh, IoT, with some um, building some physical artifacts and so on. So if you're interested like in doing something with uh, Arduino and, and so on, they, they doing this type of things, right? Uh, but they don't do a lot of programming. Um, then we have the core computer science, which, we, which you know, you are kind of here. And then we have the security department, EECO, 
and they have kind of a two main trenches. So one is the kind of the infrastructure with Eric, uh, and they have kind of they are focusing on the kind of um, infrastructure as as code. So uh, infrastructure that is physical, but infrastructure that is also um, uh, virtualized and kind of managed uh, in a virtual environments. And then they have kind of a security track. So in the security track, there are like a uh, cryptology, uh, cryptography. Uh, there are some uh, software security courses, um, uh, security management. And it, it is a little bit like uh, some of the courses are a little bit more management oriented and some are more technical, uh, uh, like with the ethical hacking and like um, some sort of a search for vulnerabilities and things like this. And, and Basel is kind of a, a lead for uh, cyber range, Norwegian cyber range, which is uh, managed by the uh, security department. And his course is kind of a little bit about this ethical hacking, right? Uh, so it is about um, finding and patching vulnerabilities and how to make software more reliable and what makes software more reliable and, and so on and so forth. It is kind of interesting because they don't do, um, they, they do quite a lot with like PHP and with uh, old style C uh, vulnerabilities because there has been a lot of research on this. Uh, the, the new research is more on uh, how the modern languages kind of prevent uh, security vulnerabilities um, like natively by the language design, right? So some of the vulnerabilities, for example, that exist um, in um, some languages, they kind of don't exist in other languages. And there is kind of a focus actually on uh, Haskell being um, um, provably secure in, in, in a way that you can't have a buggy software that you will end up with surprises, like with some exploits that can um, render the system functionality uh, not the way you want it. Um, so, but they don't do it yet. Like they, they might be doing it later, but uh, at the moment they are still doing kind of more of an imperative uh, programming paradigm and they, they analyze uh, that from, from that um, from, from that angle. But the course is also quite, um, quite good. It, it, I mean, it, this one is just an introduction, right? So the, the next semester course, software security is introduction to software security. So it will cover everything. It will cover this management. It will cover a little bit of ethical hacking and it will cover infrastructure. And it, it is kind of a, a little bit, um, uh, yeah, you guys don't see my screen. Um, yeah, so it will cover um, kind of different, uh, yeah, it's an introduction. Uh, and then you have, um, you may have, uh, there is another course I will check, I will check with Basil. There is another course, um, maybe it is called ethical hacking, which is kind of like a third uh, year course. Th this one is a second year course, which they have in the, in the program, but uh, he has one more course. And um, some courses are more like project-based, but the project is different. Like they, they do more of an analysis uh, uh, and uh, you know, security assurance compared to, the, to the, what we think about the project. Uh, so it's a little bit, um, you can say a little bit more text-based, right? Uh, but there is some, some programming as well. And uh, he tries to organize the team such that he has uh, some people with programming experience and some people with this kind of a security management experience. And they kind of uh, build something together and then write the report. Um, but I don't know, like everybody's changing because we, we never run those courses as a, uh, as a seven and a half versions. So things are kind of, you know, changing, unfortunately for everybody a little bit. So then as electives, yes, you have um, uh, game programming, you have infrastructure as a code, uh, and you have some other software, like let's say soft sciences uh, courses. Um, statistics might be good if you're planning to continue with some uh, data engineer or research career. Uh, it, it is kind of a necessary skill if you're doing research um, to be kind of a, 
to, to have basics for, for doing statistics. Uh, so that might be appealing to, to th those of you. Uh, and then those are kind of a more management, um, more management courses. So they, um, if you, if you thinking of uh, that programming is fun, but it's not something for you, and but you you manage to go up to the third year, uh, then maybe you want to kind of upskill yourself in some sort of a project uh, management or planning uh, skills. So then that might be for you. There, there are some other. Uh, courses which are kind of uh, related, um, and then in the in the final semester we have the um, uh, in spring there is this um, uh, yeah the in innovation and entrepreneurship uh, course. So I don't know about that course either. Like we never had that course before, so I don't know how it will be. But we did have an equivalent before, which was about innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, so that is for people who want to set up their own company or they want to be, you know, managing teams and managing projects. Uh, so th 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 this is kind of the, the, the line that you can take. We used to have here uh, in the fifth semester, we used to have GPU programming, which was a five point elective. And we used to have um, multi-threaded programming or parallel programming. Um, which then got split into GPU, which was kind of a really focused on power programming and uh, multi-threaded concurrent programming. So we had two five-point courses that were quite popular, uh, but uh, they were very kind of specific for uh, for the uh, for the niche programming aspects, and and uh, we were told to kind of. Uh, uh, reduce the number of courses that we have, and th those two courses were removed. <laughs> so we do have a little bit of concurrent programming uh, in Go. Like we did introduce some things, like really small amounts. Um, Carl introduced a little bit uh, in, in advanced programming. Again, we, we don't have a lot, like, but we do have zero MQ, so you can do you know asynchronous uh, patterns a little bit if you want. Uh, and then we have a little bit more in mobile because there is no way you can uh, program anything on mobile without dealing with uh, concurrency and you know multiple things happening in the background and in the foreground and rendering the UI and, and so on. So it got kind of spread a little bit all over. And of course, in operating system, I know uh, Eric is introducing a little bit of that as well, uh, but we don't have a specific course. And then for GPU programming, we don't have any, unfortunately. You can, if you want, do a little bit of it in the game programming, probably. Um, but um, I don't know. I will. Uh, I will ask Per Morton, like where he learned all the vectorization and all the sim patterns. I think he learned it himself in the job. He. I don't think we had any of that in the in the degree when he was finishing our program. I will check. Um, you can also like if you if you're struggling and or if those courses don't the, the electives don't appeal to you, uh, you can um, you can talk with me and you can talk with Katrin uh, more, and we can have um, like an individual study plan. So we do that for students who uh, fail some courses. Um, and then we kind of agree what are the courses that you will be kind of constructing your degree out of. Uh, and they can be outside of the, of the ones which are sort of the normal track. Um, so if you are kind of interested in that, you can, um, you can talk with me or you can talk with Katrina first and then we can um, yeah, think of something like this. Yeah, so this, uh, this, um, uh, whoops, this one. The AI course, this one is, is, is a little bit different to what we used to have. We used to have it more, because the term AI means slightly different things like in data science and slightly different things in games, right? If you say game AI, that doesn't mean data science AI, it means a little bit different, right? 
uh, we we had it more of a game AI before. Um, Yeah, some students were taking this one this semester and uh, there was kind of a good feedback on this course. Uh, it's an elective, so you can take it like um, next year as well. I, I mean, you, if you already took it, you can't take it twice, but those who didn't, they can take it like next year. Uh, and you can talk with some of your colleagues who took it this semester. Um, how, how was it? Um, So any other thoughts, any other questions? Yeah, I had a better meeting with a group uh, yesterday and they said, man, this project is like the, the hardest and the biggest project we've ever done. And it's like, yeah, that's what better projects are. <laughs> uh, they said they have like a 14,000 line of code right now and they still haven't finished everything yet. <laughs> So it's massive, yeah. Uh, some some of it is generated by the by the IDE, but you know they they wrote quite a lot already, um, and they yeah they they kind of saying yeah it's it's a really really big project and it's yes it is really really big project that's what bachelor is. Um, yeah, I don't know what else can I tell you. It 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 is hard. <laughs> Yeah, most, most bachelor projects are with uh, external stakeholder. Uh, so uh, you will be working for somebody. Uh, most, most of the projects are like that. Um, so there is um, uh, either a company or some uh, public office or some, somebody interested in what you're developing such that they give you the kind of the requirements and then you sort of uh, working with uh, the requirements and, and working with them. So for this bachelor project, uh, they are working for the uh, cyber range and cyber range is interested in developing games for educating kids and, and students about security. So they building kind of a mobile framework where teachers can kind of design some form of quests and then um, the students are kind of dealing with them like uh, uh, playing the, those, those quests. Um, and it is kind of a um, flexible system such that the content, the actual quests are not there. Like they are given by the, by the teachers or by the course coordinators or whoever. It's just a kind of a framework for, for allowing this to happen. So that's the project. Um, we, have, um, we have a couple of kind of projects for uh, security guys. Uh, they are... Uh, interested in training, they are interested in like automating um, the cyber range for uh, like capture the flag uh, activities, for example. Um, we, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a, there, there is a lot of different things. We, we had some interesting projects uh, with bypass uh, and with the no shipping last year. Um, with bypass about like the mobile ID such that you can use your mobile as sort of an ID card uh, with uh, no shipping for replacing the plastic card that you have to use for um, when you're buying like lotto tickets and things like this, such that you can kind of do it with the mobile phone, right? Uh, using RFID and using some mechanisms for identifying you and, and doing that. And, and they actually build a pro working prototype. So the uh, North Stepping opened an API for them and they built an app and you could actually buy like lotto tickets, identifying yourself and, and doing the purchase over uh, your mobile phone. And that, that was quite fun for them as well. Um, yeah, we had a uh, long time ago, we had a, a mobile bachelor as well, which was uh, an app, which was scoring your driving style. So it was using an accelerometer and gyroscope uh, and then GPS and was kind of giving you a, a score of how aggressive driver are you, right? <laughs> um, I know like some new cars, they kind of have it actually kind of built in. They, they tell you like how, you know, how economic is your driving and, and so on. Um, but that, 
that that was kind of fun as well. Um, yeah, it's some of those projects are kind of up to you, uh, especially if you're doing game uh, development. Uh, then uh, you can be self-driven, like you don't have an external stakeholder. Although we do have game projects with uh, some of the companies from Hamar Game Collective, um, but you can say. Oh yeah, we have this idea for this game, uh, and um, if we cannot find a stakeholder, then you will kind of be your own boss, right? Um, we have some games being done for the international school, or like learning language or le learning math. Uh, we had one cool project last year uh, in VR for learning chemistry. So they've built like uh, models of some of the chemical compounds. And you can kind of uh, do stuff with them in, in VR. So that, that was one of the projects last year. Um, yeah. Questions? Right, so if there are no further questions, um, just a quick reminder. On Thursday, we will have a informal show and tell about your projects. Um, uh, I will let you know as soon as I get uh, info from the exam office, if we can push the 7th of May back a little bit, maybe 9th or, or maybe 10th. Um, let me quickly check the calendar again. So ninth is a Sunday. Um, if, if they agree to push the deadline to ninth, I will change the peer review to be ninth as well, right? Because then it will be aligned. Uh, if they allow me to do it to 10th, I will leave the peer review to 10th. Um, the assignment to submission is tomorrow. If any of you still needs any feedback or any questions or whatever, then um, let me know or post on, the, on Discord. I know it was kind of helpful. It, it helped, uh, you know, some people to move forward. So that's great. Um, and then on 11th of, of May, I will have a session here where we will kind of discuss. Yeah, we, we will effectively discuss the exam, right? So I will go over a review of the of the course, and then I will tell you what to expect out of the exam. Um, yeah, the exam is three hours in Inspera, so you know more or less you know what to expect but i will kind of give you a little bit more hints uh what the exam will cover um and that will be it uh i don't know if you had um yeah so if you have any other questions then uh post them on the issue tracker or, or ask me on discord